structures. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to participate in the Global Poisson Seminar. So you, you see the title. Uh, now, sorry, there's something about the recording. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, God, right. For God's sake. Okay, so can I continue? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so you see the title. So uh, very quickly, I will explain, very shortly, I will explain what is this about. Uh, but before I proceed, uh, let me say that I want to dedicate this talk to the memory of Kirill McKenzie, who died uh, a year and, well, something ago, who was a dear friend of me. And I guess uh, he was a friend of many people uh, attended the seminar and uh, a real outstanding mathematician who influenced uh, some of my ideas and in particular some uh, in this work that I'm going to speak about. So the photo is due to Yakovas Andridakis. It's nice to see Kirill's face again. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, what is this talk in brief? Uh, so the key point uh, is that a thick or microformal, it's another name, morphism, uh, is a certain generalization of ordinary smooth map, but it, it is not a map. Uh, I will explain what it is, but it's not a map, but still there is a pullback, it induces a pullback on smooth functions. But the key difference with ordinary pullbacks is that the pullback by a thick morphism is in general a nonlinear map. So uh, basically when it corresponds to ordinary map, uh, the pullback, as is usual, a linear, a linear map. But uh, when it is a general uh, thick morphism, it's some nonlinear. Actually, it's a formal mapping of multi, uh, infinite dimensional vector space. Uh, so, well, for comparison, we know that pullbacks, uh, ordinary pullbacks, are algebraic homomorphisms. So we have a kind of functional algebraic duality. Spaces respond to algebras. Maps of spaces correspond to algebraic homomorphism. So this immediately prompts a natural question: uh, What happens here? What corresponds to this duality in this nonlinear setting? Uh, well, I will come back to this question at the end of the talk. So uh, why we may care about uh, such things? Why we may need nonlinear uh, pullbacks? The motivation comes uh, from bracket structures. So uh, we need them for L infinity morphisms of homotopic Poisson brackets. That's how I came myself uh, uh, to this notion. So recall that uh, for a supermanifold M, a P infinity or S infinity structure, two versions of homotopic Poisson structures, uh, generalizing respectively uh, ordinary Poisson, P for Poisson, or Schouten or Gerson Haber, uh, that means odd Poisson structure is a sequence of brackets satisfying Leibniz rule and which uh, make um, the vector space, the corresponding vector space, L infinity algebra. Um, well, when we speak about L infinity algebra, I will um, review the definitions uh, shortly when we'll come to that. So, but there are two versions. In one, one version, uh, we have uh, symmetric brackets, uh, which are all odd. And another version, we have uh, brackets of alternating parities, which are Mm, anti-symmetric, right? So in P-infinity case, we have anti-symmetric version. In S-infinity case, we have symmetric version. But whatever we have, uh, um, there is a notion, first of all, uh, an infinity algebra structure is encoded by homological vector field on a corresponding vector space. So it is a vector field, which is odd uh, in Grassmann parity and which squares to zero. And an infinity morphism, for L infinity, um, L infinity algebras uh, is uh, most naturally described as a, a nonlinear mapping, more precisely a formal mapping between the corresponding vector spaces. Sometimes you may need uh, to reverse the parity of vector space or in uh, another case. No. So, so sorry, T Ted, yeah? uh, what, what does it mean this Q tilde equal one? Uh, Q tilde equal one means it's odd. So tilde uh, means parity. So it's my oh. standard notation for parity. So one is a residue model two. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so an L infinity morphism from L infinity uh, algebra L to L infinity algebra K is, uh, can be described in terms of operations. 
so it's a sequence of multilinear maps uh, corresponding to some um, involved identities uh, with all the brackets. But uh, a very concise and most efficient way of describing it is by a nonlinear map of a corresponding supermanifolds, uh, having the property that it uh, relates or intertwines the homological vector fields which describe the bracket structure. And uh, the whole non triviality of such an infinity morphism is in uh, allowing non linearity uh, for these uh, maps of supermanifolds. So these are maps between vector spaces treated as supermanifolds. But an uh, uh, interesting case is when the map is non linear. So if uh, we have uh, P infinity coming back to the uh, case of P infinity or S infinity structure, uh, if we want to have an infinity morphism between such structures, we must have uh, nonlinear maps between supermanifolds or infinite dimensional supermanifolds, uh, where the uh, vector space corresponds to vector space is the vector space of functions, or uh, the same vector space uh, with the inverse reverse parity. So we must have a construction, a natural geometric construction, which leads to non-linear mappings between functions, between spaces of functions. And ordinary, obviously, ordinary pullbacks, which is the first idea for what we do with functions, uh, won't work. Okay. So uh, I came to this construction from a very concrete example. So in uh, 2008, Ones uh, Hudverdjan and myself introduced high analog of um, classical Kazu break. Uh, recall that if I have a Poisson manifold, uh, there is a, a Lie algebraic structure of the cotangent bundle, which uh, has uh, several manifestations. And one of these manifestations is the uh, odd uh, Houghton like uh, bracket structure on this algebra of differential forms. It is called classical Kazu break. And then um, for I'm speaking about ordinary case. In the ordinary case, so I have a nice map, basically erasing indices with the help of Poisson tensor uh, from uh, differential forms to multivector fields, which uh, uh, maps uh, Durham differential to Lichnirovich, Poisson Lichnirovich differential, multivector fields, and which is very important, uh, maps uh, the Kazul bracket to Houghton bracket to multivector fields. Now, what happens uh, if we have a homotopic case? Suppose we have a, a P infinity manifold. That means uh, we have a sequence of an, uh, sequence of high brackets, which is analog of ordinary Poisson structure, but infinitely many. And then, uh, as we found, it is possible to introduce high analog of Kazu brackets. So they, they make S infinity structure uh, on the algebra of differential forms. And it is still possible uh, to uh, construct a similar commutative diagram. So there is a mapping from forms to multivector fields, which uh, will linear mapping. I can write down the formula, but I don't want to take much time for that, uh, which uh, is the realization of raising indices. It's not so obvious as raising indices with a single uh, bivector, but it's still possible to write down this explicit formula. And which relates the Durham differential and the uh, poisson lichnirovich differential. But it uh, now it ceases to satisfy the property of the classic, of the this corresponding map in the classical case. Uh, in the classical case, so um, this uh, mapping was a homomorphism from Kazul bracket to Houghton bracket. And here we have a whole sequence, infinite sequence in general, of high Kazoo brackets, and a single Houghton bracket. So obviously, uh, one mapping, one linear mapping cannot work. So there's a question, what, what we should uh, have here? So we uh, need, uh, well, an infinity morphism, but how to get it? And in search of such an infinity morphism, I found uh, this construction of uh, thick uh, morphisms. So that's, uh, that was my motivation. Now the plan of the talk, okay? So I will, I will give you an introduction you already uh, had. So now I will give you uh, the main construction. So I give definition of thick morphism, uh, explain the construction of nonlinear pullbacks, which is central, and uh, give their properties. 
and then I will speak about applications to Hamatova brackets. Uh, and there are some other funny things there. For example, the construction of a joint for non-linear maps. We all use that if you have a linear operator, linear mapping between uh, vector spaces, then there is a dual or a joint map. If you have a non-linear mapping, uh, well, uh, it turns out that also there is a joint, but a joint now is not a regular map. A joint is a thick morphism. So you will see that. And also it turns out that this construction has a quantum version. Uh, which are realized by certain uh, uh, formal integral operators, uh, which can be applicable uh, to uh, well analog of brackets, uh, analog of uh, S infinity structure uh, generated uh, by some differential or well formal uh, formal formal operator, which are called BV type structure. Okay, and then at the end I will come back to further development, which includes this discussion of nonlinear uh, nonlinear duality. Uh, nonlinear analog or functional uh, algebraic duality. Okay. So uh, let me uh, start with the construction. So suppose uh, we have two super manifolds. Uh, you don't have to have super manifolds from the start, but applications require super manifolds. You may think that we're just order manifolds. So we have uh, with local coordinates, which I denote X and Y. I'm going to define an analog of a map, a thick morphism from M1 to M2. So coordinates on M1 will be Xs, coordinates on M2 are going to be Ys. Now, uh, I need a notation for conjugate momenta, and uh, please, people in classical mechanics, uh, forgive me for denoting by Qs uh, the momentum variables for the second ma uh, manual. Right? I don't have uh, too many letters, so Qs are supposed to be uh, position variables, but uh, here they play the role of momentum variables. Uh, of the difference between X and Y is very simple. Uh, so X is a coordinate on uh, M1 and Y is coordinate on M2. So I'm talking about two manifolds. Okay. Uh, so we have two symplectic forms. Yeah. Two symplectic forms uh, on M1 and M2. And uh, a microformal or thick morphism, Y microformal is more technical work, uh, from M1 to M2 is nothing that a just formal Lagrangian submanifold. In the, in the product of uh, two cotangent bundles. Lagrange with respect to S standard, um, it is very close to familiar construction. So it is a Lagrange with respect to a standard form, which is difference of the form on M2 and on M1, which is specified, now it's a very important part, is specified locally by generating function of the following form. So this function S depends on position variables on the first manifold, the source manifold, and on momentum variables on the target manifold. So this uh, obviously plays, uh, place, places a restriction on the type of Lagrangian submanifolds that are considered. So we're basically speaking about canonical relations, but we're not considering arbitrary canonical relations. We're considering canonical relations that can be described in this form. Uh, also, when I, I, I say it's formal, Submanifold formal in the sense that of the generating function uh, is regarded as a formal power series in momentum variables. So if you um, you may think that we regard um, cotangent bundles as a formal manifold, so formal in the cotangent direction. So the uh, the base manifold, the manifold M. Is itself is just ordinary manifold or super manifold, but the cotangent directions uh, are regarded as formal. Functions in these directions are just power series. And uh, one can check that uh, uh, if we work in the formal setting, like, like here, uh, then it is legitimate. Uh, so this class of Lagrangian sub manifolds that we uh, which can be described by generating a function of this type is well defined. So basically, what, what is needed for Lagrange submanifold to be able uh, to be able to describe uh, by functions of this type, we need uh, that we need to be able to choose axes, position variables on source, and Qs, uh, momentum variables on target as independent parameters on our submanifold. So we, we need. Uh, how to check this? We take dx's and dq's, and they must be linearly independent. Suppose they're linearly independent in one coordinate chart. 
well, on the on the prod. Uh, then we see when we check what happens uh, with them uh, in other coordinate chart, and it is easy exercise on calculating applying d to the um, to the for transformation formula for q's for momentum variables. That if you treat q itself as a formula, then it is small. And then an extra term, an extra additive term that appears there, uh, does not spoil linear independence of DQs. That's a trick. Okay. Uh, so that, that's why it is all uh, well defined. Now the, uh, the most important thing: why we need them. So how to define uh, a pullback? So uh, suppose we have a function g which lives on M2. We want to produce, it's a function of Y. We want to produce from this function, a function of X. Now look at the formula in the box. So it's kind of same explicit formula. So it is explicit formula, but uh, you may notice that at the right-hand side, you have uh, too many variables. You have all the old sort of variables that we have. We have Y's, X's and Q's. So obviously we need to get rid of Q's and of Y's. We get a result dependent on an X. So we exclude, we eliminate uh, Q's and Y's from this system of equation. Uh, well, how, how, how you can get this equation? So there is heuristically, it's very simple. So you have a Lagrange as a manifold. If you don't want explicit formulas, it can be set in one word. So uh, a function, it defines a Lagrangian submanifold in contingent bundle. So the graph of its derivative. Now we're given Lagrangian submanifold in the direct product of contingent bundle. We take the composition and the result by definition uh, should be uh, the graph of the derivative of the function, which is the image. But the key thing, so this is what's written uh, below. So this formula of the composition, lambda, uh, F equals lambda G composed with five. But uh, the key thing is that you can you can calculate. So this formula. So first of all, this formula, this uh, coordinate free formula, does not involve constants. So it's only in terms of derivatives. But uh, the genuine formula produced from a function, a function is the one written um, written in the box. Now uh, uh, one should be careful though. So because um, we need to be able to calculate according to this formula, we need to solve this system of equations. Uh, look at them. So we have Q expressing, um, being expressed as function of Y and Y at the right-hand side, the partial derivative ds of the dq again is a function of Q. So these uh, equations are not independent. And actually one need to substitute uh, the equation uh, expression for Q to the equation for y. And then we will get an equation of the form y equals some function of y. So it's a kind of a fixed point, uh, um, fixed point type equation. So it can be solved by iterations. So what we actually get, well, before I move to the next slide, I will say in words and then you'll see the form. So what uh, we actually get, we'll get a series uh, an expansion uh, dependent on the derivatives of the function uh, g. So an expansion uh, in the function g, but actually only the derivatives, no, not values of the function. That, we that will give a formula for y and in terms uh, of q. And then we'll sub n x. And then we we'll substitute this formula for y into the box formula and get uh, uh, an expression, a final expression of g. And so G appears here uh, several times. It appears explicitly as a first sum G of Y, but it also, it will uh, enter the formula uh, as uh, well uh, through Y and through Q. Uh, Ted? Yes? Um, sorry, ju just a question, but uh, when you define um, canonical transformations by generating functions, you, you always need to solve one implicit equation, right? So like one, one implicit, well, you, you should use whatever implicit function theorem once. Yes, so uh, yeah, what sure. you're doing here, right? Because uh, you are. Uh, okay, so this is, 
let me explain. So this is uh, not canonical transformation. So uh, it is very close. All of the formulas that we're using are very close to formulas that are familiar from, say, uh, Arnold's uh, textbook on, uh, on classical mathematical methods, classical mechanics, or even more Landau, Landau Lewis. But this is not ex not exactly uh, canonical transformations. So because canonical transformations are transformations of cotangent bundles. So here we are trying to do something with functions which lives on the base on M. Okay. Okay. And also, so this is um, more general in the sense that we have two different manifolds. We're talking about, uh, we're modeling a map uh, from one manifold to another manifold. Uh, actually, how one can get uh, to this to these formulas? Uh, well, uh, one um, should uh, first consider a map. One should try to consider a map ordinary map, and then a look at uh, what it induces on cotangent bundles. So uh, Kirill, uh, Kirill McKenzie always uh, like to say that look at cotangents. So it's kind of general cotangent philosophy. All problems can be solved, roughly speaking, if you examine what happens on the cotangent bundles. So if you look at what um, ordinary map does with cotangent bundles, uh, you will find an expression for ordinary pullback, which you will see in a moment, uh, in this language. So let, let's look at the example. So suppose you have a very simple, uh, very simple um, generating function, which has an additive term as zero and a function which is linear in uh, momentum variables, momentum variables on the target menu. Uh, then uh, one can calculate, it's a very good uh, exercise for a student, a look at this formula. So now, th now this equation will decouple. So this special case, then the equations will, deco will decouple. And then some miracle that if you uh, add these uh, two terms and subtract uh, y, yi, qi, then you will get ordinary pullback plus additive term. So ordinary pullbacks are obtained in this way. But uh, now it is perfectly obvious that uh, why we restrict ourselves to this linear, this fu generating functions that are just linear in momentum variables. Let's consider generating functions that are arbitrary allow all, all terms uh, in the expansion, okay? So suppose we have this um, a general generating function. Uh, and then, well, now, now uh, the equations uh, do, not, uh, do not decouple. And so we have uh, a map of phi, the, the, what was uh, saying uh, expression of y uh, in terms of x dependent on g. So it uh, can be seen as a kind of formal perturbation of the map which uh, uh, given just by the linear term in the generating function. So uh, you will get first this map as a zero order. Uh, then uh, in the first order, you will get uh, some correction depending on the first derivative of our function G. Then, uh, well, you can write down more terms and they will involve high order derivatives of G. So in general, so what, uh, and then you plug this um, in the formula for pullback. And um, here you have a formula for pullback involving the first nonlinear correction. So it is constant term, just constant shift by the function at zero, uh, then ordinary pullback. And then the first correction, which is quadratic in, uh, quadratic in G, but actually as you see it is quadratic in the first derivative of G. And if you look uh, closer, to the, all the uh, terms that appear in such an expansion, you will see that um, in the uh, um, in the term of degree, uh, say k in G, you will have uh, derivatives of uh, up to order k minus one in G. So you have a kind of formal nonlinear differential operator over the map phi. So inside each uh, thick morphism sits a genuine map which is given by the linear term in the expansion of generating function. So it's a thick morphism is indeed a kind of thickening of an order of morphism, okay? Uh, one may wonder if this coordinate is invariant. Well, it is all defined in terms of local coordinate. So, but uh, S is not, remember that S uh, doesn't have to be uh, just an order of function. So it is, it depends on the choice of coordinate system and the geometrical object with its own transformation law. So one can figure out the uh, transformation law, which is written here, uh, that uh, guarantees uh, that uh, all the constructions are 
invariant. So you can write some any coordinate system and uh, well, they sort of commute with coordinate transformation. Uh, now, uh, now we get onto something, uh, to a key fact. So um, remember that ordinary pullbacks uh, are, which are linear, are also algebra homomorphic. What we have here, it turns out so that we have a nonlinear, like a formal mapping. Uh, so we can calculate its derivative at every point. A point is a function. And it turns out that the derivative at a, at a function g is given exactly by ordinary pullback with respect to this mapping uh, defined by the function g, mapping phi sub g. And in particular, it's ordinary pullback, in particular, it's algebra homomorphism. So we come to a very uh, um, interesting class of maps between algebras with the following property. So they're not linear, but it's derivative, it's linearization at every point is an algebra homomorphism. Well, linearization is linear by, by definition, uh, but it has an extra property. And actually this extra property plays a huge role. Okay. So, um, uh, well, uh, I want to say actually more than probably I will be able to say uh, in the course of this talk. So probably I will have to glide over certain things. Uh, well, you may ask about um, what algebraic structure the sigmosis uh, make. So they make not exactly a category, they make, uh, which is better described by the word formal category, because the composition law itself uh, is given by formula similar to this pullback. And so uh, it's given by, um, uh, how, does, how to put it, power expansion. Is for, the composition law itself is formal. So it's power expansion in the derivatives, uh, derivatives or generating functions. So the composition law uh, is as follows. So you have one generating function for one morphism, you have another generating function for another morphism, and you want to describe the composition. The composition is, is exactly the composition, ordinary composition of uh, relations. So they have canonical relations, but the, the statement is that the composition of relations defined in this way will also be a relation of this kind, uh, and uh, the generating function can be, can be calculated by the formulas shown. So it's a formal category. And a composition obviously is associative, so this is, uh, this is trivial. And in the loss order, the composition is given exactly by a kind of semi-direct product of ordinary maps with uh, vector spaces attached to this object, vector space of smooth functions. So you see, um, you see the property. So uh, the structure that we obtain is a kind of formal thickening of this semi-direct uh, uh, genuine category. Uh, there is a fermionic version, which I only mentioned. I will use it, so, but all the constructions uh, go about exactly in the same way. So when we use, instead of cotangent bundles, we use anti-cotangent bundles, pi t star, and the generating functions must be odd. And there is a, a version of thick morphism, which I call odd thick morphism. They're not odd themselves, but they work for odd functions, for fermionic functions. Well, Dima, a uh, formal category is a uh, is an elk of formal group. So you know what's a formal group. So it's not a group, but it's a composition law. Composition law, which is given by power expansion, formal power series. In topology, they like formal groups very much. So, but it's a very natural notion. So you can imagine that you describe composition law of arrows in the category. Uh, you, per, you need some parameters. And so if, if you have these parameters which describe Arrows, then you define composition law in terms of power expansion, this parameters, formal power expansion. That's exactly what formal category is. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, here the difference is uh, we, uh, well, even thick morphisms, the ones that I was speaking about uh, before, uh, act, uh, act on even functions. Why we need even function? Why do we need to distinguish between even and odd functions? Because well, they have different commutation properties. So behavior of x and psi if x is 
even and xi is odd, uh, x square is something, xi square is zero. So you cannot apply the same nonlinear mapping uh, uniformly to even and odd uh, arguments. So we need to distinguish. And so uh, thick morphism based on T star M work for even function, bosonic case. Now, uh, thick morphisms um, which act on odd fun can act on odd functions are based on pi T star M. Okay. So we have two actually two different thickenings uh, of ordinary morphisms. One, uh, uh, well, one a formal category and another is another formal category. Okay. So uh, let me mention one important particular example, which brings us exactly to the question, Anton's question about canonical transformations. So uh, there is a very subtle relation between the sigma morphism and canonical transformation. Suppose we have just a single manifold. So we can think, okay, we can con consider uh, invertible thick morphisms, like thick different morphisms. So in particular, ordinary identity, ordinary map uh, is a thick morphism as well. And the generating function for the identity is just S of XQ equals X times Q. An infinitesimal thick different morphism will, will be given by adding, uh, well, some, one extra term proportional to epsilon. And this extra term turns out to be just genuine Hamiltonian. So you add to this non-invariant term, right, X A Q A. Uh, you add epsilon times a genuine function cotangent bundle, which order Hamiltonian. And the, then the pullback is given by, well, infinitesimal Hamilton Jacobi flow. That's a nonlinear action. So you have order Hamiltonians on uh, function T star M acting on function M by the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Okay, and if you calculate the Lie bracket from this action, uh, it's again a very nice exercise. You'll find, well, the canonical Poisson bracket. So we have the same Lie algebra. So thick diffeomorphism and canonical transformations. Thick diffeomorphism of M and canonical uh, transformations of T star M infinitesimally coincide, one of the same thing, right? And, and you immediately should think about, about at least two things, about a quantum version, because uh, hamilton jacobi equation, as, as we all know, is a classical limit of Schrodinger equation. So we must look for quantum version, and there is a quantum version. And the second thing, if your uh, representation is theoretically minded, uh, you recall the spinner representation. So when you have spinner representation, you have something acting in the space of dimension, roughly speaking, 2n, uh, well, linear transformations of, of Euclidean space or symplectic space acting on something which can be regarded as function of half of variables, which live on Lagrangian, uh, well, subspace, uh, well, in the orthogonal case and in, in the symplectic case, well, uh, in one case, you need to speak about symplectic spins. In one case, uh, order spins, but then you need to use odd variables. So one needs, um, Jim, one moment. So one, so one needs to ask: Is there, is there any relation with spin representation? And the answer is yes. So uh, uh, probably I will not have time to speak about that, but there is, and I will try to at least mention this uh, closer, closer to end. Okay. So uh, sorry, I missed uh, Jim's question. Uh, just let me have a look. Uh, why derivatives of only S32 mm. and no condition H? No, on H, no condition. So the arbitrary function. No, arbitrary Hamiltonian. Arbitrary Hamiltonian uh, generates a flow, at least, well, uh, Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. About uh, S uh, S three two and S two one. Well, one need to explain actually the uh, with formulas and with the proof. So it's I don't have philosophical explanation. Right. Mm -hmm. That's fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, okay. Let's move forward. So let's move. So so that 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 is just the general theory. Now, application of this general theory uh, to, to brackets, to homotopy brackets. So let me, uh, in Tempo Allegro, uh, recall uh, something about homotopy algebras. 
So we need L-infinity algebras, L-infinity morphisms. So there are two notions, uh, two parallel notions of L-infinity algebras. One notion is that that Jim prefers. So Jim prefers a version uh, with anti-symmetric brackets. That was, uh, that was originally introduced uh, in his paper, Stashev and Ladd, right? So anti-symmetric version. So we have brackets, uh, which are anti-symmetric in, uh, in a graded sense and satisfies uh, the sequence of hydro But uh, we can sh uh, shift grading and get an equivalent notion uh, of anything to algebra in the symmetric version. Now, all the brackets, there's some advantage of that. Um, so all the brackets now are odd, symmetric in that two graded sense, uh, and we have less science in the hydro But in all cases, there are two, two things that practically you need both. Practically, you need both. In some concrete examples, you need both. Uh, but both are defined defined by uh, a piece of differential geometric data, a homological vector field, which in one case uh, lives on the uh, vector space itself, in another case lives on the vector space with shifted pairs. Um, uh, and note that we identify the two graded vector space of supermanifolds. It's, they're not exactly the same thing, so, but from the two graded vector space, one can produce a corresponding linear supermanifold. Now, uh, uh, what about, um, well, okay, so you see here the exact, exact relation between brackets and a vector field. So a vector field, uh, roughly speaking, is a generating function uh, for the brackets. You take the brackets of the single argument, which works nicely in the symmetric case. Symmetric function is defined, a multilinear symmetric function is defined by its values on, this, on the same argument, okay? So you take one of the same arguments, uh, psi, uh, plug into all brackets, take the sum divided uh, by factorials, and you get homological vector field. Conversely, uh, from homological vector field, uh, you apply the uh, hydride bracket formalism, and you get formulas for the brackets. Okay. Now, the most important thing is, uh, of course, the notion of morphism. Again, uh, an infinity morphism can be given by a sequence of multilinear maps. Uh, well, anti-symmetric or symmetric, depending on which type of algebras you consider, satisfying a sequence of identities. Well, roughly speaking, the say the second, uh, the bilinear map serves as a chain homotopy uh, for, for the failure of the first map uh, to relate the binary brackets. And then there are, well, it's difficult to describe philosophically uh, high identities. It's possible to write them down, but at least the first one can be described uh, this way. The others are more, more complicated. But they all can be packed into a single identity that the map for which all these multilinear maps are Taylor coefficients uh, just relates to vector fields. So as differential geometry, uh, I prefer this uh, description. So it is very simple. So I have two vector fields. It is very easy to write down condition for a map uh, so that two vector fields are related by this map, okay? And that's what we're going to do here for P infinity, S infinity structure. Uh, so a P infinity or S infinity structure in manifold is the L infinity structure on the uh, algebra functions, which uh, in addition satisfies Leibniz rule in each argument. Now, a P infinity structure, is realization of ordinary uh, even Poisson bracket. And it is given uh, by, uh, well, a multivector fields, roughly speaking. So it's a function, an elk of multivector field, it's a function on the uh, anti cotangent bundle on pi to star m. And the brackets are defined using the high derived bracket formula. S infinity structure is an elk of odd uh, brackets. And it is specified by odd uh, function, odd Hamiltonian. Uh, and again, uh, the brackets are defined from canonical bracket by this generating element and uh, by the standard uh, hydride bracket formula. Uh, a look at this formula for corresponding homological vector field. I'm not sure that they're so familiar in the literature, so but so they're, they're very concrete. And you may see that they also have. Uh, kind of Hamilton-Jacobi form. 
So this vector fields live on infinite dimensional space of functions. So we have formulas in terms of variational derivatives. And what stands under the integral sign is a Hamilton Jacobi expression. So uh, note that in the second case, we have H Hamiltonian, uh, which is odd, uh, but functions uh, function F, this uh, is, is a point in the space of functions, uh, is bosonic. And so uh, the derivative df of the dx, uh, uh, df of the dx uh, is a, uh, even, even covector. So it's, it's indeed uh, the argument of the Hamilton is indeed a point of cotangent bundle. Uh, in a similar fashion, uh, for the case, uh, case of P infinity structure, uh, uh, this, this uh, vector field lives on the space uh, of, of fermionic functions, and this deep, uh, fermionic function psi is odd, and so deep psi the dx is odd, and so you have kind of anti covector So arguments uh, of P are as they're supposed to be, so uh, they give a, fun, uh, a point of uh, pi t star f. Now uh, the main theorem, well, main theorem of this concerns this application. Suppose we have, let me formulate it for uh, S infinity, please. Suppose we have two S infinity manifolds. Uh, S infinity structures are specified as just uh, we, we discussed by two, uh, two uh, Hamiltonians, odd Hamiltonians, H1 and H2 respectively. So we, we say that a thick morphism from a one to M2 is S infinity morphism. If, uh, if uh, the liftings of the Hamiltonians, both Hamiltonians uh, on this relation, canonical relation between T star M1 and T star M2 coincide. So you lift uh, Hamiltonians and then coincide or this, or this relation uh, given our morphism phi. Well, if you uh, work it out, uh, explicitly, so this Hamilton Jacobi type equation for the generating function. So this Hamilton Jacobi type equation uh, involves both Hamiltonians H1, which describes uh, the S infinity structure on M1, and H2, which describes the uh, S infinity structure on the second manifold. And uh, well, well, you see yourself uh, what I have to plug in. So uh, ds of the dx uh, goes for the uh, momentum variable for the first, first Hamiltonian, and ds of the dq goes for the position variable for the second Hamiltonian. Theorem, if we have S infinity morphism, S infi thick morphism of uh, S infinity manifolds, that means if we have this hamilton jacob equation satisfied, then the pullback gives an infinity morphism of the homotopy uh, bracket. So what exactly it means? So we have this uh, finite dimensional equation, equation one here for S. And so this is what is assumed. And what, what is proven that if this one holds, then these two vector fields uh, well, of the type um, uh, QH. So I have QH1 on uh, M1 and QH2 on M2 uh, are related by this uh, nonlinear map uh, phi star. So that's that's a key state. So uh, we have we have a way of a regular way of obtaining an infinity uh, mappings between uh, well homotopy uh, Poisson. Uh, homotopy Poisson brackets. So here uh, we can see um, a bosonic case. So we have uh, S infinity structure. And uh, in this case, the homological vector fields live on the spaces of functions themselves, so without changing parity. And uh, there is an analog of P infinity structures, which uh, uh, now we need a different type uh, of thick morphism, or thick morphism. The definition go go about the same, and uh, well, an Elko-Hamilton-Jacobi equation defining uh, p infinity 
uh, is the same and the statement is the same. So these two things work in parallel. Okay. Uh, now, um, I will perhaps need to move a bit faster. Uh, okay, so uh, I mentioned uh, before, so, so this is one thing that we can get, uh, we can uh, obtain with thick morphism. Another thing that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, that um, thick morphism in a nice way uh, produce analog of, um, analog of duals or joints uh, for non-linear mappings between vector space or vector bundles. You may wonder why on earth we need such things, but we actually do need, uh, because when we consider anything to anything to algebraids, it's a good example, uh, then uh, if we pass uh, to dual, uh, well, for morphisms of infinity to algebraids, are given by infinity morphisms are given by in general non-linear maps, of vector bundles. Uh, and if we pass uh, to duals, even if we work on the over same base, if we pass to duals, uh, we're at a loss, right? So what we expect for analog of uh, Lee Poisson brackets or Lee Houghton brackets? That's exactly, so we, we, we need we need a, a, a construction of a joint map. And the joint map uh, is given as a thick morphism and uh, the construction uh, well, I don't have time uh, to write to explain it in more detail. So, but in particular, it uh, uses uh, important uh, important canonical diffeomorphism, which I call Mackenzie shoe diffeomorphism. So, it's a, a, a nature identification of a cotangent bundle uh, of some vector bundle E and cotangent bundle of the dual bundle E star. So. Apply, applying that, roughly speaking, applying that to generating function, you can get from one generating function for E for original bundles, you can get generating function for the dual bundles. And this will give you, this gives you a proper generalization of uh, taking order. Remember how we calculate, how we describe a joints of a linear map. A linear map described by, by a matrix. So the joint roughly corresponds to transpose. So in the non-linear case, we have no obvious analog of transpose, but there is, so there's a Mackenzie shoe diffeomorphism applied to generating functions gives an analog of transpose. That's very rough explanation. Okay, uh, and now uh, I will glide over what's written here. So there's also anti-joint, fermionic version of that. Now I started to say about anything algebraic, so probably uh, to be able to say some uh, about some other things, I will have to uh, just jump over many things. Uh, just uh, let me just pause uh, on this equivalent manifestations of an infinite algebraic structure. So it is a, a structure of brackets and high anchors in a vector bundle, which is equivalent to a particular sort of P infinity structure in the dual bundle and S infinity structure in the anti dual bundle, pi star. and uh, homological vector field on pi L. And now, so what I, what I said about uh, anything morphism over the infinity algebraids is summarized in the theorem written here. So, uh, infinity morphism of a fixed base between two infinity algebraids induces morphisms of the corresponding, uh, well, Lee Poisson high analogs of Lee Poisson of Lee Houghton brackets. And uh, this L infinity morphism on, on functions uh, are given by pullbacks with respect to adjoints. So this uh, notation phi with lower star uh, in both cases uh, means uh, pullback or the joint. A joint gives one star, pull back another star, and all to, uh, two, two upper stars, and all together give one lower star. Okay. One particular case, uh, special case, if I have anything algebra, to have a particular an anchor, which is a, uh, a nonlinear mapping to pi CM, and then 
So uh, as a corollary, we have elephant morphism between uh, Lee homotopy, um, um, homotopy version of Lee's Houghton brackets and Lee Poisson brackets to the canonical uh, Poisson and canonical uh, Houghton uh, bracket. Okay. And in particular, this gives solution for uh, the question that I posed initially uh, about uh, brackets, high Kazoo brackets. So this construction solves. Uh, now, uh, quantum, quantum version. So uh, quantum version, analog of quantum pullback, uh, quantum analog of pullback by thick morphism, by definition, is given by uh, a special sort of oscillatory integral or special sort of Fourier integral, integral operator, which is uh, written here. So it acts on oscillatory wave functions. Oscillatory wave functions, by definition, are linear combinations of formal exponentials where you allow h uh, in the power minus one. So the phase uh, is a power expansion, is assumed to be power expansion in positive powers of h, but you, you allow to divide this phase by h. And the coefficient, the amplitude, is a, a formal power um, expansion in h. So uh, you can consider this integral you know, as written. And uh, this is what I call, so there's no, if, if you look carefully, so this is only phase here. In the integral operators, only phase, there's no amplitude. And uh, this is what, what I call, by definition, a quantum pullback. In a moment, I will explain uh, the relation the relation with thick morphism that we just considered before. Uh, before doing that, let me say that integrals of this type obviously are not new. So the first, uh, well, I explored the here the history. So integrals of this type is even slightly more general with uh, some amplitude under the integral sign were probably first introduced by Fock, uh, the, the Fock or the Fock space uh, in the end of 1950s. Mm, Fock was developing some idea of Dirac and so there's some some remark made by Dirac and Fock actually wanted to make it precise and he developed some theory which is um, uh, I think it, it was published in uh, the Messenger of uh, Leningrad so St. Petersburg uh, University uh, a short short note and also included in his textbook quantum mechanics and then in the 1960s, similar integrals were considered by people working in partial, uh, partial differential equations, uh, particularly Yegorov, uh, Vishik, uh, Eskin, Eskin and Vishik, who all were interested in um, some transformations uh, between uh, pseudo-differential pseudo -differential operators. So, um, and in, in, in more modern times, integrals of this type uh, were considered um, by uh, uh, Catania, Duran, and Weinstein. Uh, so they have some notion of quantum. Oh, okay. So I should have mentioned it earlier. So uh, there is uh, some relation between the theory that I am developing here and the sequence of work. Very interesting sequence of works of uh, Bernard Duran, uh, Alberto Catania, and Alan Weinstein under the general title uh, symplectic. Uh, microgeometry, where they uh, uh, introduced, well, they were considered a version of canonical uh, canonical relations between the symplectic manifolds uh, in general, which are roughly speaking jets, um, no, no, just, sorry, no, not jets, but germs, germs uh, at Lagrange's manifold. And uh, due to tubular uh, neighborhood theorem, Due to Alan uh, Weinstein, uh, you can visualize uh, such such germ simply as a cotangent bundle of something. So uh, the notion of a symplectic micromorphism is very close to the notion uh, the, the the notion that I consider in, in the works is very close to the notion that I consider here, uh, but with kind of different purposes. So uh, so in 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 their works uh, they uh, were thinking about a micro version of uh, canonical canonical relations so to avoid problem with the composition of canonical relations. 
And I was uh, thinking rather in terms of, of base manifolds themselves, not cotangents, but M's. Okay, so it's a different viewpoint. And in particular, in the last, um, uh, last perhaps not the last, the latest, latest paper in the series, uh, so um, Benoit, uh, Alberto, and Alan so introduced, um, considered uh, quantum, certain quantum operators that look very uh, well, almost as here, actually more general than here, because uh, they include also amplitude. So the, the, the explicit formals that we use are slightly different. So, but uh, essentially they're the same. So they use uh, they use extra structure, uh, like like connection or formal exponential. But if you look at the formulas, so this uh, all these formulas can be the formulas that I present here also can be written in terms of connections or formal exponential. I just easier to, to write them very explicitly in local coordinate system. So uh, the integrals themselves have been considered and are still being considered. And obviously they are a particular class of, of Fourier integral operators. What is essential for my approach that I consider things formally. So I have uh, actually two formal parameters here. One formal parameter is H, which just appeared. And another formal parameter is Q. So I have formal uh, expansion in Q. Okay, all this said, so, uh, so S generating function is expansion in Q. And what's what's the relation with what was said before? So there's a classical limit. So if you apply this to oscillatory function, oscillatory wave function, exactly oscillating uh, oscillatory exponential of some function f, then and you take this, apply this a quantum pullback to that, then the result by using the stationary phase formula, one can show using the station phase formula will be exactly the pullback by morphism uh, over a similar, well, sorry, the phase, the phase of the result will be uh, thick uh, pullback by thick morphism uh, of the first term in the expansion by H first term of the function of the phase uh, of the original function. Okay, so this is a proper uh, classical so uh, the thick morphism are proper classical limits of these integral operators. Or the, put this differently, these integral operators are a quantization or quantum version of thick morphism. Uh, Ted? Yeah. Uh, just, just an eighth question. So your, your integrals, so they are defined uh, as some kind of uh, uh, expansion, like a steepest descent expansion, right? Or yes. what is that? De that's the definition of your integral. Right. Yes, uh, because H is a formal parameter. Yeah, yeah. So but, every... uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have classical limit, and uh, now the integral, but integral can be, actually these integrals can, can be calculated in different ways. So one way is exactly by this uh, stationary phase formula. If uh, you apply you see the integral itself. Let me be slightly more precise. So the integral itself includes W. And well, the, the, the particular form of W is not specified. W is linear combination, possible linear combination of various oscillating exponentials. So if you apply, you need to apply, if you want to apply a stationary phase formula, you need to take one particular exponential and then, uh, well, assemble everything uh, well into into the phase and then calculate station phase formula and the station phase formula will give you exactly the formula for uh, pullback by thick morphism that I started from that's a statement but this is not not, not all uh, you may just uh, try to calculate this integral directly and it's slightly different formula I uh, suppose you split in your expansion generating the function, you split the terms into three groups, additive term, constant term, constant terms of, of, of Q, linear term, which corresponds to a mapping or H perturbation of the mapping and high order terms as plus. And then uh, this integral uh, is given by, it can be, can be solved explicitly. So look at the formula. So what you have to do? You take your function w, and then you apply to this w the, the 
of the infinite, uh, well, it's infinite series, so it's a formal H differential operator, which is obtained by substituting Q, the, uh, the momentum variable for the um, target manifold, substituting by the, well, partial derivative, well, uh, well times H, partial derivative respect to Y. Ted, yep. if you allow for one more question, but, the, but this formula, um, is it really an answer? Because you in, in your W, you also have this exponential one over H, right? So the, the, there is a question how well defined this expression is, right? I mean, maybe uh, it is. S but... plus, Anton, S plus. S yes. plus means S plus means that it is uh, of, uh, of order two or higher in Q. And because of that, uh, you have... Uh, uh, no, but still it builds on a very particular, I mean, it, it, it does build on a very particular shape of W, which will probably bring us back to the previous formula or not. No, no, no. This does not expect uh, anything from W. What I, what, what, I, what I was saying that it is well defined. If you can uh, apply this formula to W uh, with all the, uh, expon a Slater exponential form. So, but in principle, this formula, so it, this formula is closed formula. There's no expansion of H here. Okay. So, and, and what is this formula geometrically? It's, the, it's a formal a linear differential operator over a map. So you, you, what is differential operator over a map? So it is, I guess it's classical concept, but not so well known perhaps. Well, it's should be textbook concept. So you, you have two manifolds. You have a function of the second manifold. You differentiate it with respect to coordinates of the second manifold. And then uh, you substitute. Uh, you substitute uh, coordinates of the second manifold as function of the first manifold and multiply the partial, you take coefficients dependent on coordinates of the first manifold, right? It's a generalization of the notion of vector field along a map. And here we have exactly the, this situation. So, and then you multiply by a phase factor. So that's, that's a closed form of this quantum pullback. Uh, now, uh, because time is, is running, so let me move forward. Uh, so um, uh, let me say very quickly uh, what kind of application of these quantum pullbacks uh, may have. So uh, we may want, if you want application to brackets, we, we may consider brackets generated by some operator. Well, think of operator like H differential operator or formal H differential operator. Then we may consider two types of brackets. Uh, just quantum brackets where you don't pass to the limit h tends to zero and classical brackets when you pass to this limit okay and uh well i have to glide over certain things and the main statement is the following now uh okay uh, one thing that i want to pause on uh, again the formula of homological vector field if i have vector brackets generated by differential or whatever operator delta, then you have a nice form of homological factor field like battalion vilkovsky equation, battalion vilkovsky formula. And uh, suppose you have two manifolds, two super manifolds, each equipped with odd formal H differential operator. So each square into zero, each generates a sequence of brackets, actually two sequences, classical without limit H equals zero and, and uh, Quantum, sorry, quantum without uh, sending h to zero and classic. So by definition, uh, a quantum pullback or quantum thick morphism given by the integral operator as before, uh, such that it uh, intertwines these two differential operators. Question, how to get, what, what, how, what is the relation of that to brackets? We want an infinity map for brackets. Obviously, we cannot get an infinity map from something linear. We again have the same problem. Integrals are linear mappings. Uh, yeah, but this is a, a funny way of doing that. You can uh, put this linear mapping, this integral, into two nonlinear. You can first take exponential and then take logarithm. But without pass, it's like uh, lifting of the uh, stationary phase formula. You take your function, you take this ex oscillator exponential, apply integral operator, take log. And this gives theorem, this gives an infinity morphism. So, and 
this is a lifting of the statement that was before that Sikh morphism provide anything to morphisms for um, uh, homotopy Poisson, uh, Poisson brackets. So that's, I don't have time uh, to explain, but this analog to the Igor theorem in partial differential equations. So although it looks at very different area of mathematics, so homotopy algebra and stuff, so uh, it is related to very classical things about um, questions that people uh, start partial differential equations were considering in 1970s and actually which prompted the introduction of reintegral rates. And uh, 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 well, there's quantum analog what I said about um, about action of Hamiltonian, so but I have to follow that. So we have Schrodinger equation here, uh, no doubt. Uh, but let me jump and let me finish with the discussion of the question that I posed at the beginning. So we have a philosophy of duality between spaces and algebras and maps and duality between maps and algebra homomorphism. There are many embodiments, many manifestations of duality. For example, in topology, you have uh, kolmogorov gilfan duality where we have a Hausdorff topological space and to compact and to it corresponds to the algebra real el real valued continuous functions. And the, the theorem of Kolmogorov and Gilfan is that all algebra homomorphism, not bound of algebra, just, just algebra homomorphism between such algebras corresponds to continuous map. Well, we know that, well, non, um, I'm not speaking about algebraic geometry, obviously, so, but super manifolds defined this way. In particular, we know that uh, for the uh, differentiable manifolds, all homomorphism between algebras of differentiable functions are obtained by pullbacks. So, what do we get here? Uh, so we, we, we can introduce, as written here, a notion of nonlinear homomorphism of algebras. Well, say we consider formal mappings between algebras such that uh, the derivative at each point uh, is an order of algebra homomorphism. What we can say about uh, about this notion when we consider smooth functions? So uh, the theorem which I conjectured uh, some time ago and was recently proved by Havarnes Khodorjan, so that uh, if we have a formal map between algebras of differentiable functions, which is a nonlinear algebra homomorphism, that means derivative uh, is order homomorphism, then it arises from some thick morphism. So it's, it's a pullback by some thick morphism. Actually, it's, very, uh, it's not hard to guess uh, what's the candidate for the thick morphism? Because uh, the generating function for a thick morphism can be reconstructed from pullback. You just apply pullback in the same way as one reconstruct formulas, coordinate formulas for ordering maps by applying pullback to quadrant functions. Here, it's not, suffi it's not sufficient to consider just isolated coordinate functions. We apply to linear combinations. So if I have on the target manifold YICI, where CI as a parameters, this linear combination of coordinates, and you take pullback of that, the result, which is a function of X's and this parameter C, actually is exactly uh, the generating function uh, of alpha morphism. So if we are given some map, some map L, then we can just apply L to this linear combination and get some function S. So the question is whether this function gives the answer, whether the thick morphism corresponding to this function gives the um, pullback, which is uh, the original map. And the answer, the answer is yes. And here, so this was proved by Hudverdian about a year ago. So uh, this, uh, this, this condition of nonlinear algebra homomorphism plays a crucial role. Yeah. Okay, well, there are various open questions. So. For example, about gluing using thick diffeomorphism, about action on forms homology. There's some progress in that, so I define action on forms. Uh, also about closed formulas for pullbacks. Uh, and I think um, in a different, um, in a paper, so there must be some relation with uh, some early work of uh, Catania and Felder. So when, uh, I need to look closer into that. So the, for in this question of the, the grammatic technique. So, uh, 
So they may, uh, what they did may help to obtain uh, formulas for um, pullbacks by thick, uh, thick uh, morphisms. Uh, well, and uh, some other questions in all, all cases. So my time is definitely uh, is, is over, more than over, I would say. So this is just a list of references. So uh, probably you're not going to make a uh, photo of them. So, but well, here's, so all, it's all started uh, from earlier paper, uh, which uh, and I wrote in 2008 with high cousin brackets, but the history of this non-linear pullback started from uh, 2014 and and hopefully still continues. So this is a reference for the recent paper by Hudeverdian about non-linear homomorphism of algebras induced by sigma. This is an archive. And that's it. Thanks a lot, Ted. <laughs> My pleasure. And so now it's time for questions. You can raise your hand or just speak up. There are some questions on the way. So maybe, maybe, people are a bit maybe I, I ask a very quick question. Just, just to be very sure. Uh, uh, so you start out talking about super manifolds, but uh, if I understand correctly, all of this also makes sense for ordinary manifolds? Yes, yes, obviously. So uh, for the definition of thick morphism and non-linear non pullback, you don't need any superstructure. So superstructure pops up when you consider the brackets, because then you need homological vector fields. Uh, otherwise, uh, a lot of things will be trivial. Mm -hmm. And could you imagine any applications uh, just for ordinary manifolds? Uh, I think yes. If one uh, if uh, looks closer, applications can be already existing. Uh, if you look, uh, well, what, what Igor's theorem that I mentioned is uh, one may rethink this classical statement from about um, pseudo differential operators or partial differential equations uh, in terms of thick morphism. So it obviously it was not formulated this way. Uh, let me... So um, yeah, th that's one. Okay, any other questions? Um, uh, I got a question about quantization. Uh, so, so how, how is it uh, traditionally something like deformation quantization, right? Are uh, any questions from this traditional theory, would they be covered by this notion of uh, quantum morphisms? Uh, well, actually, um... Quantum morphism are kind of simpler uh, in a way. So they, of course, they are quantization, but they are quantization on cotangent bundles, right? And uh, for example, uh, well, without the word, the whole theory of uh, pseudo differential operators can be regarded as quantization. So if uh, you work with uh, full symbols of pseudo differential operators you actually have a quantization because uh, you have a relation between the function, the full symbol, and an operator. Now, this quantization is a coordinate dependent in the sense that it is written in a particular coordinate chart and the full symbol of the pseudo differential operator is not a genuine function, a cotangent bundle, but rather a more complicated geometric object. And this is exactly what happens here. So uh, in part, there is an overlap with the classical theory of uh, subdifferential operators, only where uh, uh, we consider things uh, formally. Well, let me just show you some example. Yeah, maybe just to restate the question. So can I take some classical quantization problem, probably from deformation quantization, since you have a power series in H, and can I restate or solve or do something visit in in this formalism just because you, you know i i recall that in uh, in those papers by duran and courses so they were looking at the tree tree part of uh, of the quantization problem so here do you go beyond the tree part or how i mean what, what's uh, what's the status of it uh, well i can uh, 
I don't have uh, an answer precisely to your question, but uh, I can say about something which is related to that. So what I should mention before. So um, you know that a spinner representation can be regarded as sort of quantization. Right? So spinners are obtained, um, uh, the space of spinners is a, a space where quantum operators act. So this one, one of the approaches to spinners. But spinner so, representation is, is quantization of quadratic Hamiltonian. Yes, exactly, yes. Here, uh, th that's right. So, uh, but uh, what I wanted to say uh, is that if you uh, restrict ourselves to uh, linear, instead of general supermanifold, consider just a linear spaces, uh, then uh, cotangent, uh, cotangent bundles of them can be, uh, they again, they're uh, symplectic vector spaces. And you will get a category uh, of symplectic vector spaces with uh, canonical relations between them. And uh, there was uh, a generalization of Berezin's formulas, which is due to Yuri Nielsen, uh, which give a, a kind of spinner representation, spinner representation for this category. So uh, now if you look, if you apply this, uh, the formalism of quantum, uh, quantum pullbacks here, it turns out that it gives something that we very close, so which is equivalent uh, to this uh, uh, Berez Nielsen formulas, uh, but uh, it also does uh, gives some cycle when you for composition, the composition of morphisms, uh, uh, but which is different different cycle. Now, uh, as for um, as for high, so this is for quadratic quadratic Hamiltonians and for quadratic uh, generating functions. Um, as for high of as for high order, what what what, um, uh, what, uh, what in this works of um, uh, Catania, Catania, Deren, and Weinstein uh, is given? I don't think that at least at the moment. So I can go further than that. Right? So. Um, so their results uh, in the in the later in the latest paper in the series, uh, just uh, substantial the lab with what I'm saying here about a uh, uh, quantum quantum case, but uh, I haven't tried. So then the answer is that I haven't tried to apply these constructions to the problems. So I was considering different problems. So to the problems that they wanted to consider. So I guess um, a formal approach. Uh, in terms of power expansions uh, in Q, uh, may may give something more uh, something more concrete. So, but again, uh, at the moment, so I, I cannot uh, provide uh, a particular state in this direction. Okay, thank you. This is something to look uh, well, for open questions uh, to look at. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. You bet. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, very quickly uh, uh, BV operators. And uh, I think you said, or it was obvious, that they do generate some uh, uh, S infinity bracket. Yes. Uh, is there such a formula for the uh, Salton bracket? That's the uh, delta operator uh, generates? Uh, yes, Yvette, so this is a, uh, what I mentioned actually, is a generalization or a familiar formula for the- oh, this, is, this is the formula, yes. Yes, of order two. So Kazu in, 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 his, in his work uh, introduced brackets, well, this, he didn't call them brackets, so he introduced operations phi, operations phi uh, from uh, an operator acting on, uh, on on algebra, and then he concentrates on the case of case of operators of order two. Now, what's difference? Uh, kind of slight difference. Um, so I can see the modification of Kazu's construction. Modification by introduction of a uh, parameter of Planck's constant. So, um, uh, well, one can define age differential operator, which is a particular special case. Of a different age differential operator of certain order is a special case of dif just differential operator. When you commute it with functions, uh, you get a also a power, a power, a power of age. And so you have two series, 
uh, two series of brackets. Mm -hmm. Why we need that? Uh, in the case of operator of order two, so the necessity of considering, well, uh, two types of brackets are somehow masked. So this is a correct formula. Well, in truth, it's correct formula for considering higher brackets generated by, generated by an operator. Okay, I see you have you have explicit formulas, in fact. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any remaining questions? Okay, uh, I got a I got a question. Maybe um, so there is this older theory of uh, formal symplectic groupoids by Karabegov and also Catania and Felder. That's um, exactly that I wanted to make a link, a link with. So uh, actually I haven't started this series, so, but there's certainly the, the, there must be an, an, um, certain things in common, right? So uh, that is an open question to consider. Because there you have a formal neighborhood of the identity of the zero section in the quotation bundle. Right. Well, my understanding is maybe, maybe, maybe Alberto, if he's here, or so or, or, or Alan or Benoit may, uh, may answer this question. So my understanding is that there was a work about the form of subjective report. And then from this work, uh, somehow uh, they moved to this works on um, sympathetic micro, uh, micro geometry. And this original work was more explicit. In a sense, uh, so uh, and perhaps some explicit parts so were kind of forgotten or temporarily abandoned uh, in this uh, series of syntactic microgeometry. So um, it would make sense, obviously, to come back to the uh, the, the earlier work of Catania and Felder and uh, compare with the constructions here. So that's what I really wanted to do. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else? One more question. Please go ahead. Um, well, some people have been looking at uh, uh, mixed structures like uh, Poisson, Nimehuis, and such. Uh, have you ever encountered any uh, uh, infinity mixed structures of this kind? Not yet, Yvette. Not yet. Not so yet. Next, it is worth looking at. But do you think it would be a worthwhile uh, enterprise? Uh, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. One can always generalize. Okay. No, 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 not, not in this sense. No, no, no. Uh, well, I guess all these differential geometric structures, if uh, properly formulated, then uh, contain within themselves nature generalization. So it's uh, yeah. like in what I was doing. So if you write, uh, if you write in the cotangent terms ordinary map, then you immediately well using Kirill's cotangent philosophy. So if then you immediately see that uh, you can kind of close. Uh, the category with order maps by allowing uh, all all terms in this power series, right? So that's that's the nature of generalization. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. I think it's getting kind of late, so uh, let's thank uh, Ted one more time for a very nice talk. Thank you. And I believe next week is going to be uh, the Eastern Hemisphere edition. Uh, Yongen O oh is going to speak. So Eastern Hemisphere means that it's going to be three hours earlier. <laughs>